Behind locked museum doors, some of the world's most complete fossils do not belong to dinosaurs. They belong to a 10-foot, horse-eating bird with a skull the size of your carry-on. While the Smithsonian and the American Museum of Natural History showcase partial T-Rex bones, almost perfect forest racidae skeletons, soft tissue, and all, gather dust out of sight. Why would institutions hide creatures that could outrun, outhunt, and out-terrify anything Jurassic? The real scandal is not what is missing from our museums, it is what they are deliberately keeping from you. And what exactly are they afraid you will learn next? Deep inside the research wings of America's most celebrated museums, the rules change. The public halls echo with the familiar names, T-Rex and Triceratops, the crowd pleasers with their missing ribs and fiberglass tails. But through a set of badge lock doors, the real treasures sit in silent rows. Fossils so complete, they make the centerpiece dinosaurs look like jigsaw puzzles missing half the box. At the Smithsonian, drawers labeled in tight handwriting hold bones from a bird that could stare a draft horse in the eye. The American Museum of Natural History's collection log lists a skull nearly three feet long its beak still sharp enough to give a curator pause. The Field Museum's inventory includes articulated leg bones, so perfectly preserved that even the muscle scars read like a forensic report. Access comes with a laminated badge and a chaperone, usually a research curator with a practiced poker face and a key ring that weighs more than your lunch. Ask about the terror birds and you get a polite smile a practice line about conservation priorities, and a gentle nudge toward the public exhibits. The official policy is that only a fraction of the collection is ever on display for reasons of space, preservation, and visitor comfort. Translation, the 10-foot apex predator with a 71-centimeter skull stays in the back, while a cast of a half-complete Allosaurus gets the gift shop treatment. Specimens like Kellington Guillermoy discovered in Patagonia and now cataloged in museum records, are close to 95% complete, right down to the tarsa metatarsus and phalanx. Some even preserve the impressions of muscle attachment points, a level of detail that would make any dinosaur mount jealous. Yet, unless you are a credentialed researcher, you will never see them in person. The public-facing halls offer a sanitized parade of safe, distant monsters. Meanwhile, the birds that ruled South America for almost 60 million years remain a private affair, glimpsed only by those with the right clearance and a willingness to sign the visitor log. Apparently a 40-foot lizard is educational, but a 10-foot bird is emotionally damaging. The question lingers, what makes these fossils so unfit for public eyes? And who exactly decides what stories get told? Forest racity, better known as the terror birds, belong to a family of flightless carnivorous birds that once ruled the prehistoric plains of South America. Their story stretches back 62 million years, during a period when that continent was an island unto itself, with no big cats and no canids, just a cast of mammals and these towering avian predators. The family tree includes over a dozen species, ranging from dog-sized sprinters to giants that would make an ostrich look like a petting zoo reject. The smallest terror birds stood about three feet tall, but the real nightmares came in at 10 feet, with the largest, Kellington Guillermois, tipping the scales at nearly 350 pounds and sporting a skull longer than a bowling pin. Terror birds were built for pursuit, not for flight. Their wings had shrunk to stubs, but their legs told another story, long, muscular, and engineered for speed. Some estimates put their top speed at 30 miles per hour, fast enough to make even the most confident prehistoric horse reconsider its life choices. The skeletons reveal a predator designed for efficiency, with a rigid triangular skull for stability during strikes, a beak hooked and reinforced for puncturing bone, and a neck packed with muscle. The beak alone could reach up to 46 centimeters, roughly half the length of the entire skull, and it ended in a point any blacksmith would admire. Kellenkin was not the only heavy hitter. Brontornis and Forest Rakos also stalked the Miocene grasslands, each adapted to different prey and terrain. Some terror birds specialized in ambush, others in open pursuit, 
but all shared the same core features. Immense size, powerful legs, and a predatory toolkit that left little to chance. Fossilized leg bones show adaptations for both speed and grappling, with sharp talons and a sickle-like second toe. While their wings were mostly for balance, their feet did the real work, pinning, slashing, and subduing prey. Ecologically, terror birds filled the role that big cats or wolves would later claim. They competed directly with South American marsupial predators, often forcing these mammals to retreat into forests while the birds owned the open ground. For nearly 60 million years, forest Rosidae sat at the top of the food chain, a reign that only ended when new mammalian competitors arrived from the north. Their bones, scattered from Patagonia to Colombia, tell a story of dominance, one that is hard to ignore, even if you are only allowed to see it from behind a locked door. A forensic biomechanist stands in front of a digital skull, rotating it with a flick of the mouse. The screen glows with a CT scan of Andalgalornis stuleti, a cousin to the giant Kalinkin. Every ridge and suture is mapped, down to the last millimeter. The question is not whether this bird could kill, it is how. Finite element analysis, the same method used to crash test cars and to simulate football concussions, is turned loose on the fossil. The result is a skull built like a sledgehammer. The beak is not just long and hooked, it is engineered to funnel force onto a two-inch point like a pickaxe with feathers. Under vertical load, the digital skull shrugs off stress that would shatter the bones of modern birds. Lateral forces are different. Sideways impacts send stress lines spidering across the simulation. But that is not how terror birds attacked. The neck vertebrae, thickened and fused, form a rigid column, perfect for driving the beak straight down again and again. No need for subtlety when your business model is blunt force trauma. The numbers are impressive, even if they are more about physics than poetry. The skull tolerates vertical blows that would make a hyena jealous. As the biomechanist deadpans, you are a prehistoric horse. Your best bet is to avoid eye contact. It is not just about size or speed. It is about a predator optimized for one thing, ending the chase with a single devastating strike. An ecnologist kneels in the dust of Patagonia, brush in hand, studying a line of fossilized footprints pressed into ancient mud. These are not the scattered, lonely tracks of a wandering predator. Instead, three distinct sets run parallel, each stride measured and in sync like a prehistoric relay team. The largest prints stretch over a foot long, toes splayed for traction, the deep impressions suggesting a bird weighing 300 pounds. The spacing reveals a steady, ground-eating pace, no wild zigzags, no panicked scatter. The trackways curve together toward a single point, then fan out again, as if the birds had converged on something and then dispersed. Stride analysis hints at more than coincidence. The intervals match, suggesting the birds moved as a unit, not as competitors jostling for scraps. In the world of ichnology, that is a rare clue. Coordinated pursuit, not a solo ambush. The evidence undermines the old stereotype of terror birds as solitary bruisers. Instead, it points toward calculated group strategy, three, maybe five individuals working in tandem. The ichnologist, notebook in hand, sketches the pattern. It is not proof of a hunting party, but it is the closest thing to a smoking gun in fossilized mud. Out on those Miocene plains, the prey list reads like a lost menagerie. Toxodon, early horses, ground sloths, herd animals built for running, but not for outpacing a pack of 10-foot birds with legs made for speed and beaks built for bone. If the fossil record whispers of teamwork, it does so in stride lengths and toe angles, not in roars or feathers. For museums, that is one more reason to keep these birds behind badge-locked doors. Predators that did not just hunt, they were organized. Two million years ago, the South American plains were anything but not safe. Herds of Toxodon, hippo-sized tanks on stumpy legs, grazed alongside early horses, while giant ground sloths lumbered through the brush. This was the terror bird's shopping list. Forest Residi targeted anything big enough to be worth the effort, but slow or unlucky enough to fall behind. Fossilized remains of prey 
show puncture marks and fractures that match the size and shape of a hooked beak, driven with enough force to shatter bone. The menu included mammals up to 500 pounds, creatures that by all rights should have been too large for a bird to handle. Yet, the evidence says otherwise. The timeline is where things get uncomfortable. Forest racity did not vanish with the dinosaurs. Their reign stretched from the Paleocene, 60 million years ago, right up until about 1.8 million years ago. For context, Homo habilis, the first member of our genus, was already making stone tools in Africa by 2.3 million years ago. The difference between the last terror bird and the first human is measured in a few hundred thousand years, not tens of millions. In geological terms, they missed each other by the margin of error in a radiometric date. That proximity is hard to ignore. While there is no evidence terror birds ever met early humans, the fossil record leaves the door open a crack. Most apex predators are safely locked away in deep time. Saber-toothed cats, dire wolves, even T-Rex. But forest racidae stalked the world almost yesterday. For museum curators, that timeline feels a little too close for comfort. A museum studies scholar sits across from a spreadsheet, glasses perched at the tip of her nose, tallying up numbers that would make a Wall Street analyst blush. The equation is simple. Families and school groups pay the bills. In a typical year, nearly half of a major natural history museum's revenue comes from membership programs, field trips, and birthday parties under the fossilized gaze of a T-Rex. The marketing department calls it edutainment. The finance office calls it keeping the lights on. Behind closed doors, exhibit committees weigh their options. Dinosaurs are a safe bet, reptilian, extinct for 65 million years, and conveniently lacking any living relatives that might show up and startle a toddler. Saber-toothed cats are furry, familiar, and dead enough to be comforting, but a 10-foot carnivorous bird is a harder sell. The problem is not scientific, it is psychological. Birds are everywhere, from backyard feeders to Thanksgiving dinner. Put a giant predatory version in the main hall, and suddenly the line between past and present feels a little too thin. Parents complain about nightmares. Teachers ask for alternative routes through the gallery. One internal report, never meant for public eyes, describes the risk of negative visitor experience as high. So, the calculus is clear. Keep the terror birds in storage, where only researchers and the occasional graduate student with a strong stomach will ever meet their gaze. The public gets a parade of deep time monsters, safely separated by millions of years and a thick wall of evolutionary distance. The birds that once ruled the continent remain a backstage secret, too modern, too close, and above all, too real for comfort. The idea of a 10-foot bone-crushing bird is unsettling enough, but the discomfort runs deeper than feathers and fossilized beaks. For most of human history, the story we tell ourselves is one of conquest, Toolmakers outsmarting the wild, top of the food chain by birthright. The fossil record, though, whispers a different story. In South America, for almost 60 million years, mammals lived in the shadow of birds. Not clever little robins, but avian predators tall enough to look a horse in the eye and fast enough to run one down. For generations, indigenous communities spun tales of monstrous birds, giant shadows that snatched livestock and sometimes people. These stories echo across the Andes and Pampas, long before paleontologists arrived with their calipers and field notes. This is not just folklore filling gaps in the fossil record. It is a memory of an epic when mammals, our branch of the family tree, were not always the apex. Museums prefer their predators safely extinct and comfortably reptilian. A T-Rex is a lizard-shaped warning from a distant past, but a bird with a hooked beak and a timeline that nearly overlaps with early humans, that is a story with the wrong hero. It challenges the comforting narrative of human triumph. The bones in storage do not just belong to a bird. They belong to an age when mammals survived by keeping their heads down and their herds tight. And for curators, that's a harder story to sell next to the gift shop. In the world of natural history exhibits, not all bones are created equal. The centerpiece dinosaurs, the ones posing for selfies in the main hall, 
are usually 40 to 60% real fossil, with the rest filled in by resin, plaster, and a little creative license. Sometimes a famous tale is just a best guess attached to a borrowed hip. Meanwhile, the terror birds wait in storage, their skeletons approaching 90% completeness in the best cases, with skulls and leg bones so intact that even the smallest muscle scars are preserved. Some specimens, like the Kellington skull, are nearly untouched by time. Measuring over 70 centimeters from beak to back, every ridge and suture accounted for. The contrast is hard to ignore. The public gets a partial T-Rex, while a near-complete apex predator from the Cenozoic sits in a drawer, filed under research only. The numbers tell a story that the display halls never mention. For every dinosaur mount that is half imagination, there is a terror bird fossil that is almost entirely original, bone for bone, claw for claw. Scientific value, preservation quality, evolutionary significance. By every metric, these birds should be stars. But behind the scenes, the verdict is already in. Museums choose comfort over completeness, spectacle over substance. The fossils are not missing, they are just too real for the script. In the end, it is not a lack of evidence that keeps a 10-foot bird out of the spotlight. It is the uneasy feeling that some stories are better left in storage. Today, museum halls spotlight ancient reptiles, while the most complete evidence of bird apex predators, creatures that once outperformed mammals, waits behind the scenes. As institutions curate comfort over reality, our understanding of nature's past predators grows quieter. The fossils remain, their lesson unresolved. Sometimes the true thread is closer and more familiar than we'd like to admit. On your next visit, ask what is missing. You might not like the answer.